Now, I've never been one for caring too much for watching cartoons. Even when I was a youngster growing up, I didn't much care for cartoons. But I do love to watch the Peanuts specials on television. Especially this time of the year. It won't be the fall until I see it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown. And then we'll have uh, Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And you know how many, how, how many times Charlie Brown tries to kick that football, Lucy's going to pull it out from under him. And I do especially like the Charlie Brown character because I think I can kind of identify with him in some ways. It's just that he just never quite, get, never quite gets there. It's not because he doesn't try. Charlie Brown tries very hard. He just can't seem to quite get there to where he needs to be. Usually because he gets hooked up with Lucy who has some deep-seated philosophy in her advice to him. And Charlie Brown's frustration with life usually comes out. Remember one episode in particular that Lucy is philosophizing with him about people that are on a cruise ship and she says, Charlie Brown, life is like a deck chair on a cruise ship. Some people place it so they can see where they're going. Some people place it so they can see where they've been. And others place it so they can see where they are right now. And in typical Charlie Brown fashion, he sighs and says, Lucy, I can't even get my deck chair unfolded. <laughs> well, you know, more than a few of us can identify with Charlie Brown because life gets tough sometimes. And some of the choices that we have to make are very difficult. We find ourselves, like the old saying goes, between a rock and a hard place sometimes. Stuck between two possibilities with an argument going either way. Neither way is wrong, just both ways are different. And these are the times in our lives that we refer to as dilemmas. We have them all the time, sometimes more than we want. And there are many different kinds of dilemmas. You know, you think a dilemma is a dilemma, but no, there's all kinds of dilemmas. Let me share a few of them with you. There is volitional dilemmas. You know what a volitional dilemma is? Well, I bet you do. This is when we want to do two things at the same time. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about being in two places at the same time. That's another one. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I'm talking about wanting to do two things at the same time. That's a volitional dilemma. Young couples who have recently been married, maybe only a few years, many times have volitional dilemmas. They may want to purchase a home, but they all also may be anxious to start a family, but they know that it's not economically practical to do both of those things at the same time, especially if one or both of them is still in school, in college. Then we have emotional dilemmas. We deal with those all the time. They can be even worse. This occurs when we have different feelings about the same event. Good example, we went through this about 10 months or 11 months ago. When you have a cherished pet, you know, our pets are not now and we're not then our pets. They are members of our family. They are our children. We baby talk to this dog we have now like he was a four or five year old grandkid. You have a pair of cherished pet who's a member of your family. You have bonded with this animal. You are inseparable, but now the animal is suffering. And from something that cannot be cured by any medicine or miracle from the vet, and the only way to provide the relief means that you have to put the animal to sleep. And it's a difficult and painful choice because you love this animal and you have bonded with this animal. You know, the... The time between when we put McGregor down last October and when we got Max the end of April, the day after Easter, coming home on Sunday mornings was the worst because I usually get home from here about 10 or 15 minutes before my wife does and walking into that empty house. And now when I get there and I unlock the door, I can look through the window on the door as I'm unlocking it. I can see a nose looking up at me and that little stubby tail that we had worked on going back and forth like this. We miss that so much. 
But you know, what about, there are other emotional feelings. What about dealing with rebellious adult children? They may or may not have moved out of your house or may have moved out and moved back in again. And their lifestyle is disappointing to you and maybe even to God. But it's obvious that financial assistance on their part is needed and maybe even asked for. It's an emotional dilemma on what to do on your part. And then we have, as I said, geographical dilemmas. Now, this is not being trying to decide between staying home and watching a TV show and coming to church to a meeting. Okay, that doesn't count. You need to be here. Geographical dilemmas are when we want to be in two places at the same time. And a good example is maybe you love the home that you're living in. You've lived there for years. But maybe moving to a smaller place now or a better neighborhood would be more practical or more beneficial. Where you are now, you have cherished neighbors and friends, but a smaller place is more practical. Neither dilemma or situation is ideal, but both of them have benefits. And whenever we are faced with dilemmas, we are usually pulled in two different directions. We feel the strain and don't know quite what to do about it. And I can tell you this, I'm learning and I'm still learning that being older and wiser doesn't help. Okay, that doesn't mean that we are immune to dilemmas and problems. As Charlie Brown put it, there are times when we find it difficult to even get our deck chairs open. We can't even unfold them. Well, all of this brings me to the Apostle Paul in our scripture today from Philippians. Paul was a prisoner of Rome, and if you are familiar with the book of Philippians, then you know that Paul responded positively to his circumstances to the church in Philippi, and actually wrote a joyful letter of encouragement to the church in Philippi. In fact, the Philippian letter is best summed up by the verse Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That's what Paul wrote. But even with such a positive attitude toward his situation in life, Paul admitted that he had a dilemma of his own to deal with. Paul said in the scripture this morning, For me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with my Lord, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful to you. See, Paul was torn between what he wanted to do and what he felt was best to carry on his ministry and to spread Christ throughout the world. Now, there was no doubt that Paul's most intimate relationship on earth was with Christ. No one else in his life meant more to him. Therefore, the thought of being with Christ brought Paul all kinds of joy. Just like the song we just sang a few moments ago, Jesus is all the world to me, my joy and my life and my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When someone who means that much to you on earth goes on to heaven, it creates a dilemma because you want to be with them right now. Not years from now, not days from now. You want to continue to be with them and you want to continue to have the relationship that you had with them here. But at the same time, Paul realized that his work on earth wasn't finished yet. And as Paul put it, I am hard pressed between the two. You see, Paul faced the choice of what was better for him or what was more necessary for the kingdom and for the church at Philippi. Now, let's look at the two choices that Paul had on this day. One of Paul's choices was to move on. In other words, to die. And what were the benefits of dying? Well, Paul would be with Christ instantly. He would be with all of those who had gone on before him. He would be free of all life's hassles and all life's frustrations. And I think we are all looking forward to that when we don't have to deal with the frustrations and day-to-day tribulations of life. And Paul would be in a place also where there was no more suffering or no more pain or sorrow and no more death. At the moment of death, Paul knew that he would immediately experience uninterrupted joy because he would be with his Lord. But what were the liabilities of Paul dying? Well, Paul would have to leave 
those who needed him on earth, which would seriously affect the spiritual growth and his ministry and the missionary activities that he was doing would have ceased. So as good as death may have seemed, it wasn't without its liability. So Paul had that choice. The other choice was to remain, that Paul talks about, and continue on in his ministry. Well, those benefits were obvious. He would have a hand in the spiritual growth of many in Philippi and on around the world. His role as teacher would continue, and his vision of reaching a world for Christ would continually grow farther and better. But what about the liabilities? Well, Paul would remain absent from his heavenly home and absent from his Lord. He would remain in prison, and his physical and emotional pain would only increase. This would mean more suffering and more persecution. Now, you might think that Paul could make this choice without too much difficulty. After all, he was a strong and faithful soldier in the kingdom of God, a wise counselor, faithful servant to God, but according to his own words, Paul said, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Both choices made logical sense. Neither choice was wrong, but both had positive and negative points to them. Now, at this point, let me say this. When we arrive at such dilemmas in our own lives and are unable to decide which direction to go, it's very important that we turn to the Lord for direction with our dilemmas. As James said, if any of you lack wisdom, and what is wisdom? Wisdom is nothing more than the ability to make the right decision. When you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to you. That's important to remember, because every Christian at times faces these trials and tribulations and heartaches and temptations and dilemmas that threaten to overwhelm each of us in our lives. And even in the midst of such dilemmas, sometimes not even our closest friends or our family are able to provide much comfort and much strength. So we turn to God. Folks, I cannot overemphasize the importance of prayer, talking things over with God. There's a song that we used to sing years ago. It's in the old Brown Cokesbury hymnal. It says, just have a little talk with Jesus. Remember that song? Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faint cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer wheel turning, and you'll know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in and let a little light from heaven fill my soul. He bathed my heart in love and he wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. It's amazing how much peace comes when we put our dilemmas in God's hands and on God's shoulders. You know, you're not going to solve any kind of a dilemma by sitting around and worrying about it and stewing about it and fretting about it because it's not going to change. You know, somebody used to tell me, well, my mom used to say it, you know, if you, you go to bed and sleep on it, things will look better in the morning. Well, that may be true with some things, but, you know, if I was worrying about a test at school or something, my mom would say, well, just sleep on it tonight, things will look better tomorrow. And I'd get up in the morning and say, well, no, because now I'm a day closer to taking that thing. You know, it's still there. It's still looming out there. We're still trying to find a solution for it. Instead of turning to God, we turn inwardly to our own devices, and it just doesn't work. We can't do it. But it's amazing how much peace, because I've been on both sides of this fence, folks, how much peace comes when we put those dilemmas on God's shoulders. Paul said later in his letter to the church at Philippi, be anxious for nothing but pray about everything. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. But our problem, which again is another dilemma, our problem is we aren't willing to do that. How willing are we to completely put all of our dilemmas in God's hands? Do you all do that? Do you put 100% of the time Take all of your dilemmas, all of your problems, all of your trials and your tribulations and put them in God's hands. 
You might say that you do, but I'd be willing to bet you're like I am. If you do that, you find yourself maybe even an hour later worrying about it again, thinking about it. What am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to get it done? We're not willing to do that. We say, in our own minds, we say, I can take care of that myself because I am responsible enough to make my own decisions. How many times when we were growing up did our parents say to us, you know what, you are responsible enough to make your own decisions about things. How many times did you say that to your own children? What should I do? You are responsible enough now at an age where you are responsible enough to make your own decisions. So we, are, we have that drummed into us from the time we're 10 or 12 all the way up into our lives. So it's no doubt that instead of turning things over to God, we turn back and revert back to what we learned when we were growing up. I can do this because I'm responsible enough to make my own decisions. Letting go and letting God take charge is one of the most difficult things that Christians can do in their lives. But oh, how we need to do that. If nothing else, we must force ourselves to trust God. Because to trust someone else is going to like take us down to a road that we don't want to go. We have to learn how to trust God. Trusting God who is far more capable more intelligent and more responsible than we could ever be. So, what was Paul's decision? What did Paul do? Well, what he tells the church in Philippi is, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all of your process and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Through prayer, God made it clear to Paul that his plan was to have him remain and continue the work that he was doing. And God will do the same thing for us. Through prayer, if you are diligent enough, if you are benevolent enough and trusting enough into God, God too will make it clear to you what you should do in your life. In Paul's case, even though to remain in his life was to continue causing him problems, more suffering, more sorrow, more emotional and physical pain. Even though departing would have been great, it would have brought him instant joy and relief. It would have brought him instant rewards for a job well done. Paul accepted God's decision and unselfishly pressed on. That's the other problem we have. We may hear from God. We may know what God wants us to do, but if we don't want to do it, then we resist that. Paul unselfishly pressed on. We don't want to do that sometimes. We go back to the well again and say, Lord, is this what you really wanted me to do? I'm not sure I heard you right. Is this the right thing you want me to do? Let me, let me give this to you again. Because it wasn't the answer that we wanted. We have to, we go to God. We have to be ready to accept what God's answers are. Making decisions in the midst of dilemmas forces us to rethink our priorities. And there is nothing like a dilemma in our lives to bring us to what is most important in our lives. And what is most important to us is doing what Christ wants us to do. You know, there are many voices around us trying to get us to do other things, trying to, to persuade us to do other things. Some are very loud. Many are persuasive. Many are convincing. It can be confusing, and we can be tempted to look out for number one, what we think is best. But if you want lasting joy, lasting peace, if you want peace of mind, then put God first. Be willing to do what God wants you to do above all else. It may be tough. No, it won't. Maybe it will be. It will be tough. Sometimes you have to make unpopular decisions in your life about you and about other people. But you will never regret it. As Paul said, my soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who have lapsed into falsehood. He who trusts in the Lord will prosper. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. He who walks wisely will be delivered. Today is the day. 
to walk wisely with the Lord and be delivered. And how do you do that? It's like I said, just have a little talk with Jesus. Tell Him all about your troubles. And He will answer by and by. When you feel that little prayer wheel turning, then you'll know there's a little fire burning. And you will find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. Lord, we know that there are times in our lives when we don't listen to You. We rely on our own responsibility. But Lord, we know that we have to trust in You. So this day, Lord, if, if there are those here who are wavering, if there are those here who are, who are stubbornly hanging on to what they believe is right, Lord, I pray today that they will have a little talk with You and know that trusting in You will make all things right. These things we ask in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.